I'm just going to mutate some pictures for a minute or two until everyone's here. Okay, welcome everyone to episode 18 of Games with Go. We are in the process of making <clears throat> a little game where you can evolve uh, pictures. Last episode, we did a big refactor of how our picture trees work. We use an abstract syntax tree to represent an equation that draws these crazy pictures. And uh, we got mutation working. So we set it up so we can click and mutate one node of the tree at a time, one random node. So that's where those changes come from. And today we're gonna to start setting up a UI so we can actually turn this into something that people can play with. What we're gonna do is it'll look something like this. So we'll show some number of, <clears throat> of our random images uh, in a grid pattern. And we'll make it generic so it could be any number of rows and columns we want um, so that it'll work on different size screens. We can customize it to fit. And we'll have some kind of button at the bottom that <clears throat> uh, once we've selected images that we like, that we want to let survive, we'll evolve them and make a new set of pictures based on the ones that were selected. And we'll let people select any number of images they want. If they want to just do one uh, or, or all of them, if they like all of them, that'll be fine. They can do whatever they want. So something we're going to want to do, though, is each of these images takes a fair bit of time to compute. Um, depending on how big the tree is, it could be a few milliseconds or a few seconds. Now, we don't want the UI to be frozen while it's rendering all the images. You always want to keep the UI working. So you definitely want to have at least one background thread to draw all the pictures so that you can still do things. Like for instance, even just clicking the X button on a window, you need to have the main thread active to detect that and close the program. <clears throat> um, but even better than that, we have an easy opportunity here. Each image is completely independent of the other. So that's an easy problem to uh, make multi-threaded. We can have all of the cores available on the person's CPU working on images at the same time um, by just creating a separate thread, or in our case, go routine uh, for each image. And then even better still, rather than waiting for every Go routine to finish before we start drawing everything, as soon as each one finishes, we'll go ahead and draw it on the screen. So <clears throat> results are visible on the screen as quickly as possible to make everything feel, uh, feel nice and quick. So let's get started. <clears throat> uh, one quick thing I wanted to add, because I've been starting and closing this program a lot, is uh, check to see if... Uh, we hit the escape key. So we've got our keyboard state variable, which has an array of uh, all the keys and whether they're being pressed or not. So we're just gonna look for uh, scan code escape. And if that's not zero, then we'll return. And that just lets us uh, start the program. Oh, keyboard state. Why don't we have keyboard state? Let's get it. sdl.getKeyboardState, we'll set that array up, <clears throat> and then it's managed internally by SDL, so we don't have to do anything except check it. Okay, now we can start it up and hit escape to close it, just to save some time. Okay, so first step is we're currently just making one random picture. We're gonna make a bunch. So we'll make uh, an array, we'll call it uh, pick trees. And this is going to be an array of uh, pictures. And how many should we have? Well, let's make sure that that's configurable rather than hard coding it. So 
Let's do a uh, rows and columns. And we'll just make this uh, three by three for now. Declare it like that. And <clears throat> I'm also gonna go ahead and make this not constants uh, for reasons I'll explain in a little bit. And we're not gonna need depth here. <clears throat> in the balloon program, we had a depth to the screen. We're not gonna need that here. All right, so we've got rows and columns. So we can just change this whenever we want if we wanna have uh, more or less images uh, in each population on the screen at once. <clears throat> So then uh, also let's go ahead and do this. <clears throat> we'll do numpix. So we'll have the number of pictures on the screen available to us really easily all the time. So this will be numpix. We'll have an array <coughs> of numpix picture trees. And we'll just do a loop. And then inside the loop, uh, <clears throat> instead of just setting these, this is where we're going to use our uh, go routines. This should be pick trees. So go routine, start them off with go, and then just specify a function. And we're going to use uh, an anonymous function. So we can just type it in place. And let's see how we're going to do this. Yes, yeah, so we're going to pass in the index as well as a pointer. Oh, this should be an array of pointers to pictures. And yeah, we'll just pass in the index for now. Okay, so this part here in the anonymous function declares that it takes in a variable we're going to call i, and it's an integer. And this here at the end actually passes it to the anonymous function. And remember, it's important when you use goroutines inside a for loop to actually pass that value i in, rather than just trying to use it directly, because that i value is going to be changing as you go through the loop. And you want every goroutine to have its own copy of i. <clears throat> okay, so we want our uh, picture. Let's just call this pictures because it's not a picture tree. So our picture, we're going to use our apt to texture function. Let's we'll see here. Okay, we need we need both. We need pictures and picture trees. We'll say textures. So we'll say textures pointer to sdl.texture. And to generate the trees, we'll just do a uh, normal for loop. Because generating the trees is fast. Oh no, we can do that inside the loop two. Let's not for now. Let's try it like this. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we're going to call <coughs> a new picture. Which makes a picture uh, <coughs> for each element in the array of uh, <coughs> array of pictures. So that gets us the tree, and then we need to generate the textures, uh, and that's the expensive part that'll be slow. So we use SDL textures. So our uh, <coughs> picture will be pick trees of I. Then we need a width and height. 
So where are we going to get that? So we'll actually need to compute that based on how many, uh, how many pictures we have on the screen and how big the screen is. So we'll compute that up here. Uh, picture width will be want the width of the window divided by how many columns there are. And then <clears throat> we make it a little bit smaller than that. So we'll do 90% of that size by multiplying by 0.9. Uh, that'll just leave some space. So there can be a little gap between each picture. And same idea for the height. And then height divided by the rows. 0.9, that'll get us 90%. This will be pick width, pick height, and then we need the SDL renderer, which is used to generate the pictures. And this should be textures. Okay, <clears throat> now, in, when we last used uh, Go Routines and Channels, what we did uh, was we generated uh, different parts of our Perlin, no Perlin noise, and we waited until all the Go Routines were done. In this case, we don't want to wait till they're all done. We want to get results from Go Routines as soon as each one is done, uh, because one of these pictures might generate faster than another if it has a small tree. Um, others might take longer, and as soon as the one's ready, we want to get it. So we're going to have a different uh, different approach here. We're going to use a uh, channel and pull stuff out of it as soon as it's available. So let's do a uh, texture channel. We're going to be putting SDL textures into it. And <clears throat> we're going to make it a buffered channel. So it'll have room to hold up to, or basically it'll have room to hold all of our textures if it needs to. Get rid of those two. Okay, so once a given texture is done, we can take our texture channel. This should just be singular texture. And <clears throat> this syntax puts our texture into the channel. And a channel is basically like a, a thread safe queue. You can put things into it and take things out from multiple threads at the same time without anything going wrong. Okay, so now what we need to do in here, uh, let's pull this stuff out. So we're going to take out our, our mutating <coughs> stuff here on left click that we were using for testing. That's not going to make sense right now. Okay, so now what we need to do is get stuff out of the channel as soon as it's available. Um, so the way to do that is we need to look at the channel and see if there's anything in it for us to get. Uh, Rain of, uh, of Animosity asks, does it currently generate anything in this state or is it in early stages? Uh, yes, it generates stuff. Um, the stuff I was showing at the be beginning of the stream uh, were some examples. Um, there's a bunch of my Twitter feed right now. I can't run it right now because we're in the middle of changing it. But uh, here's a, this is one of my favorites. This is one of the random images it generated. And uh, so far, we're just generating random images, but we're going to be evolving them. So it has the potential to get more interesting because you'll pick the ones that are your favorite. They'll get The functions will get combined, and so you'll potentially get things that look better and better as we evolve them. <clears throat> All right. So to get things out of a channel, we need to check to see if something's in it without blocking. We don't want to wait till something's available. We just want to check. Uh, each time we render a frame, we'll check to see if there's more stuff in the channel uh, for us to pull out and put on the screen. So the way to do that in Go is the select keyword. So we will get a texture and an OK or not out of a channel. Like that. So this is getting uh, <clears throat> multiple results from our channel. Uh, if it's got something in it, we'll get the texture and, and okay or not okay. 
And if it's okay, that means we've got something available to render on the screen. And then the uh, default case, we're not gonna do anything at all. So the default case is when there is nothing available in the channel uh, to do. All right, so we're just gonna keep going to the next frame and not draw any new pictures because none are ready yet. Okay, but if one is ready, we need to figure out where to draw it. Um, so let's compute the <coughs> uh, X and Y index that we're gonna have for our grid. So this would, like, this would be zero, one, two uh, for X, zero, one, two for Y. We can compute those. And uh, yeah, so something else we want to do is we're going to want to know when we get a texture out of a channel um, what index it was in our picture tree. Because we're going to want to know for each picture uh, which picture tree or which every image, which picture tree it came from, right? We're going to want to know the data that generated that image because uh, if someone selects it uh, with their mouse, then we're going to want to carry that over onto the next round of evolution, right? So we've got a texture and we need to know the tree, function tree that's associated with each picture. So what we're going to want to do is this channel should actually contain uh, two things, a texture and an index. And there's a way to do that with uh, anonymous structs, or like a, a shorthand way to do it with anonymous structs. So let me go remind myself of the syntax for that real quick. Okay, yeah, so what we'll do is this channel will contain an anonymous struct, which will have a texture and an integer, that'll be the index. And so we're gonna have to put in a texture <coughs> and an index into it. Uh, yeah, so. Ah, these are separated by semicolons, not commas. In both cases. Okay, so now we've got a channel that uh, returns textures and an, a texture integer struct, and we're sending it a texture and integer struct. So i is the index from the picture tree array, so we'll be able to take uh, the texture we get and know what picture tree it came from. And then here, this is going to be a texture and index. So we need to get the <coughs> values out of our anonymous struct, which you can do like this. Okay, I think that's good. Okay, so now we need to compute our x index and y index. So this will be index modulus columns. And this will be index minus xi divided by columns. And then we'll get the actual uh, pixel value. And we're going to be providing this to uh, SDL, which always uses int32s. So we're going to cast it for that. OK, so we take the <coughs> index value times the pick width, right? So if this is 0, it's going to be uh, the 0th pixel. The index 1 picture will be uh, <coughs> multiplied by pixel width, which we'll put it over here. 
And then the same idea for y. Stick height. <clears throat> then we're going to want some padding to put a little bit of space in between each image. Right, we made <clears throat> the uh, uh, the width for each picture uh, based on the width of the screen times 0.9. So our padding will take up the rest, 0.1. And we'll add the x pad times All right, so the zero width uh, image will get uh, one set of X padding, the first will get two, and so on. I thought I made none of these constants. Oh, okay. So for anonymous structs, you specify the types. And then the data. Types with semicolon data with a comma. Well, okay. Go format. Format's not crazy. That's fine. I guess it works like that. Okay, why is this unhappy? Oh, we're missing a... Uh... Parens are wrong, that's why. Okay, then add the Y padding. And then to uh, draw a texture in a particular place with SDL, it uses a, uh, a rectangle. And it's got a built-in rectangle type. So we'll use that and it'll just be X, Y. <clears throat> so the rectangle is just an X and a Y, then a width and a height. This should be curly braces. And then we want to take our texture. And draw it at that rectangle. Pointer to erect. Okay. Okay. A couple of errors still. Mouse state we're not using, so let's comment that out. Previous mouse state we're not using. Let's comment that out. I'm not using pick. Or we can just do. That. 
Okay, so now we've got a <clears throat> bunch of Go routines that get fired off, fill up a channel, and then in our game loop, we keep checking the channel and render it if we have uh, an image. Oh, this is not what we want to do. We want to fill our We want to fill our textures array with the image. So what we're going to do is this textures Okay, textures of i equals text Uh, index. Then we'll take all of this, cut it, I come with text, range textures. Call render.clear before we draw. So this will just draw all the textures uh, if they're available. We should probably check if text is not equal to nil. Because at first it'll be the texture will be nil until we get it out from our uh, from our channel. So let's give this a try. All right. <clears throat> It crashed immediately with this weird exit status. So what has happened, and this happens a lot with game engines and libraries, so it's something to be aware of. Aware of. We spawned multiple threads to do some work. And one of the things we did in that work, in this uh, picture tree to texture function, is we used the SDL renderer, right? We used the SDL renderer to take our pixel array and turn it into a texture. So it turns out you can't do that. It is, not a, it is not designed to be used by multiple threads at the same time. You need to use it in your main thread. A uh, similar thing will come up if you use uh, Unity, if you use multiple threads in Unity and try to use uh, any of the functions or most of the functions in the Unity API, uh, it'll fail. Now this doesn't mean you can't use multiple threads in Unity or with SDL. It just means you have to do your work, get it done, put it back on the main thread and then start using SDL. So this is actually easy to fix. All we need to do is get <coughs> uh, our pixel array back, because that's the part that takes a lot of work. Generating the texture from the pixels takes no time at all. So what we're going to do is just make this return pixels. So this will return a byte array, a byte slice. We won't return pixels to texture anymore. We'll just return our pixels. Let me come down to our channel, and this will be a byte array instead of a texture. And we'll call it a pixels channel. Anonymous structs not like having slices in them. Well, that's silly. All right, we are not going to use an anonymous struct then. It doesn't seem to let you put arrays inside of it. So we're just going to do uh, make our own struct. It 
pixel result, and then we'll use that in our channel. And I guess that will save us the messy anonymous struct syntax anyway. Okay, so our channel will contain pixel results. <clears throat> And this will be a <clears throat> pixels this will be a pixels channel and then let's rename apt to texture to apt to pixels that's what it is now okay that returns a byte Our channel now has our pixel result struct. <clears throat> we send that in there. And then now down here, this will be pixels and index. So now we can make our texture in the main thread. Because when we're in our main loop, we're back in the main thread. So we can call our pixels to texture function, which can use the renderer safely. We will take our pixels and index dot pixels, give it the width and height. And now we get back a pic uh, texture. And then this will be pixels and index dot index. And this is pixels channel. Okay, let's give it a try now. All right, there we go. So now we've got a grid layout, and this is all done on multiple threads. So as soon as uh, any of these results are ready, we see them. And we can maybe uh, illustrate that happening more clearly. Now uh, let's go to our new pix our new picture function. Let's make these like really complicated trees. So they take a long time. And you can kind of see them popping in. So this will be a minimum of 50 nodes up to 150. So now you see how they pop in as soon as they're as soon as they're done, as soon as they're ready. All right, <clears throat> cool. Let's bring this back down to something sane. All right, cool. And then one of the nice things is because we made this uh, all nice and general is we can go really crazy here. We can do any number of rows and columns we want. And it works out fine. It just takes a really long time. But we can do hundreds. Or just 100. All right, so we can do any number we want. We can even make rows and columns a different number, right? We can make them oddly shaped. <clears throat> And it all just works. Okay, so next step is we need to have a way to uh, select these things so that people can select which ones survive. So what we're gonna wanna do is turn these into uh, buttons or put the images inside buttons. And we wanna build a button control and <clears throat> try to make it nice so it's reusable. And so we can kind of have the start of a, of a little bitty GUI, a simple GUI library. So let's make a whole new, uh, uh, folder and file for that and we'll call it uh, we'll just call it GUI the file will be GUI.go and the package name will be GUI okay so one of the things uh, we're going to definitely need is our buttons will need to know uh, uh, if they've been clicked on 
And in order to do that, they'll need to know about uh, mouse state. And so <clears throat> you remember back when we did the little balloon, the balloon game, we built up a mouse state struct and made some functions to deal with it. So I'm going to want to actually move this into our GUI package because uh, we can't have, like it's, this, basically managing the mouse is basically going to be part of the GUI. All right, so I'm going to take this, cut it out of here, and bring it up here. All right, and then <clears throat> this particular GUI is going to depend on SDL. That doesn't have to be the case. People make uh, GUI libraries that have no dependency on a particular renderer, um, which is a cool thing, but that is beyond the scope of this. So we're going to make a little GUI library that depends on SDL2. So we're going to import it. And then another thing, you remember when we were working with the mouse, is we were keeping track of uh, current mouse state and previous mouse state. So I'm going to simplify that a little bit by building that all into our own mouse state struct. So we'll have a left button, right button. Uh, we'll have previous left button, previous right button. previous x, previous y. And then uh, now that this is going to be in its own package, remember that in Go, things have to be capitalized if they're going to be exported. Right? Capital is basically public. That's private. And we're going to go ahead and start with everything public. And we can think about later if there's things that don't need to be public, and we can make them private. So we're going to make this return a pointer to our mouse state. And that needs to be capital. <clears throat> capital, capital. OK, so this is going to get uh, an initial mouse state. And then we're going to need a function to update it. So this is something that you'll want to call uh, every frame. It's going to set all the previous things equal to the current things. Then we'll get the latest current state from SDL. basically copying this logic. We could actually simplify it a little bit. We could do a Make it a one liner. Okay, so all we have to do is call this uh, every frame, and then we can easily see what the previous and current states for our mouse buttons and positions are. 
So that's going to help us make our image button. All right, so we're going to make an image button now. So <clears throat> we're going to need an image. We're going to use SDL textures for the image. We're going to need a rectangle, which is the place on screen we're going to draw it. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to have some bools for whether it was clicked or not. Now, one way you can do buttons like this, um, rather than doing this, is you could have something like a, a function that it stores instead. You could have a callback function so that when you create a new image, you pass it the function that contains the code you want to happen when the button is clicked. Um, and you see this a lot in some, some GUI libraries. You see it a lot with like JavaScript. So the way you can make buttons work in JavaScript as well. Um, this, this can be nice sometimes, um, but just having a button that you can ask it if it's been clicked is uh, sometimes more flexible and more simple. Uh, so we're gonna do it this way, but uh, if you're interested in, in using like on-click callbacks, I encourage you to experiment with that too so you can get a feel for um, in what ways it's nicer and in what ways it causes more problems. Uh, and then our buttons will have a notion of being selected. So like when you click it, it will be, you know, depressed or selected. And then we're going to have some way to visually indicate that it's been selected. And we'll do that with a, uh, we'll do that with a texture. And I'll, I'll show you a neat trick to use like a really small texture to do something useful. All right, so let's give our image buttons uh, constructor. So we use the convention of calling it a new image button. So that'll need a renderer because we're going to make a texture for the uh, selected texture. And we're going to take the main image for it. Take the rectangle that says where we're drawing our button. Then we'll take a uh, color, and the color will indicate what color the selection uh, indicator is. That'll be configurable. And then we'll return a pointer to an image button. All right. So to do the selected text, we're going to do a trick where we make we're going to make a texture, just a really small one, one pixel, in fact. We'll use the same format we've been using, which is a b g r eight 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 eight. I'm going to make the texture access static because we're not going to be changing it. Uh, that may have some performance benefits. Check for error. If we get one, fail quickly. So now we're going to make the uh, color for our single pixel texture. One, two, three, R, G, B. And off. Copy and paste my typo. Okay, <clears throat> then we update our texture. With our pixels, our singular pixels. Now we have enough to make our image button. We've got the image, the rectangle. All these billions will start out as false and the selected texture we just made. All right, that gives us a button. And now we need a function that will check to see if the button's been pressed or not. We'll call it update. Um, and that's gonna take a mouse state.
And the first thing we want to check to see is if uh, the mouse cursor is even uh, located uh, on top of the image button or not. If it's not, then we don't have to worry about anything. We know it couldn't have been clicked. Um, so the built-in SDL rect has a uh, function we can use called has intersection. So we can just see if the rectangle for the button has an intersection with a quick rectangle we'll make with the uh, current mouse position. Now it'll just be a rectangle of one pixel. All right, so if it does intersect, then we need to check to see uh, if a button was clicked. So we will set our was left clicked uh, boolean equal to mouse state dot previous left button and not mouse state dot left button. So we're saying if the previous <clears throat> if on the previous frame the left button was being held down, and on the current frame it is not, then we're going to call that a click. We'll do the same thing for right clicked. Okay, and if, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and if it was not, then we want to be sure to set was clicked, left click equal to false. Because if at some point previously the state of the button was that it had been clicked, we don't want that to persist over multiple frames. Or at least I don't want it to. You might want it to if you wanted it to behave differently. All right, last step is the image button needs to be able to draw itself. And it'll need a renderer to do that. Okay, so uh, this is actually really easy. We just copy the button's image to the button's rectangle. Uh, except the <clears throat> last step we want is we want to be able to uh, draw some sort of indication that it's been selected. So what I'm going to do is just put a border around the image. And we can do that with our single pixel texture. So we'll check to see if we're selected. And if we are, we're going to make a border rectangle. We'll start out with our border rect equal to the button rect, and then we're going to adjust it from there. So we're going to figure out our border thickness So we're going to take the width of the uh, button as it starts out. And we'll just get 1% of that. All right, so 1% one, 1 of the starting width of a button will be the width of the border. So if we have uh, fewer images on the screen, the border will be bigger. Or if your screen's bigger, it'll be bigger. It'll adjust. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is just draw a big square that is the extra 1% uh, in size uh, behind the button. So we'll draw the square first and the button on top. Border thickness times two, because we're doing it on the left and the right. Then we need to adjust our X and Y. Subtract away the border thickness, uh, which just centers it. Then use the selected texture, draw it at the border rectangle.
pointer to border rectangle. All right, <clears throat> that's our high tech GUI library or image button anyway. All right, so current mouse state, we're not using that anymore. Delete the previous mouse state, delete this previous mouse state. So we are just going to have a <clears throat> outside the loop. Oh, we need to import our GUI library. So we'll do <clears throat> the dot import. Okay, <clears throat> imported it. And then just because before a loop, we'll do the uh, get the initial mouse state. This is our, our touchscreen code here that just manipulates the, the mouse state to trick it into thinking the touchscreen is the same as a mouse. And then we'll call a mouse state update every frame. So we always have an up-to-date mouse state. And then we need to check in our main loop if a button's been pressed. Oh, we need to make uh, we need to make buttons. So how should this work? Probably the way this should work is this textures will become buttons. And this will become image buttons. This should have been pick trees the whole time. Okay, so we're gonna have a buttons array. And we'll wanna take this code that comes up with the rectangle Move it into here because we're going to make our image button in here. And that's going to need the renderer. What else? Uh, the image, that's the texture, the rectangle, and a color. We'll just make it white. Let's see. Render image rectangle. This should be a pointer. Okay, so now we got a button. We'll put that on our buttons array. And then in here, do we still have a textures array somewhere? No. We still have an error here somewhere. Oh, there we go. All right.
Okay, so now this will just be buttons. And if the button is not nil, we dropped Give it a try. All right, I'm clicking and nothing is happening. Oh, now I know why. We also have to call update and pass the mouse state. That lets our button figure out if it's been clicked or not. Oh, and we have to check uh, if Okay, so in this case, we're leaving it up to the user of the button to decide what should happen if it's left clicked. You could also like build in that it gets selected when it's left clicked, um, but you might wanna have some buttons behave differently. So I'm not doing that. So I'm, it's up to us to check to see if it's left click and if it is set it equal to selected. Or maybe what we wanna do is uh, toggle it. So If it's not selected and you left click, it'll select it. If you click it again, it'll unselect it. That'll be better. Whoa. Okay, that's a cool bug. <laughs> I think we got our rectangles uh, crossed somewhere. Let's see. Oh, yeah, I know what's wrong. So we're using pointers to rectangles, which we don't actually want to do that anyway. So make that rectangle not a pointer. This will be not a pointer. And we'll probably have to adjust something in here. Yeah. So what was happening is we were setting the border rectangle equal to the button rectangle. When that's a pointer, it means that they're actually becoming the same thing. And then we were making it a little bit bigger each time over and over and over. So it zoomed in at us. which is not what we want, but it's kind of fun. All right, let's try again. There we go. So we get a simple white border indicating it's selected and we can easily change that color or the thickness if we wanted to. And this will automatically adjust We'll get a slightly bigger border if the images are bigger. So the border size scales to the screen size and the image size. All right, so that'll be how people select what images they want to survive. All right, and the other thing we're gonna end up doing, uh, there's not enough time tonight, but we're gonna make it so when you right click on an image, it will uh, zoom in on it. So if you just wanna look at one closer, because you think it's cool. You can right click and it'll go full screen, right click again and go back to the single screen. So that's it for tonight. What we're gonna do next time is uh, probably do that right click functionality so you can zoom in and then also start the uh, like breeding of new pictures stuff. So we'll actually have a button you can click. You'll click that and we'll start doing uh, crossover and mutation on the pictures that have been selected to generate a new population so that you can iteratively make cooler and cooler looking pictures. Any questions about what we did so tonight? Uh, did tonight? Any comments about the stream? Questions about previous streams? Anything is fine. I will play around and make some random images 
for a little bit. So this should adjust to different screen sizes too. Yeah, everything will just size itself reasonably. All right, looks like nobody has any questions. Uh, Keep in mind, if you uh, subscribe to the channel, you'll get access to the source repository where you can see, uh, you, can, you can check out the source code uh, at the state it was in during any particular episode. And if you have an Amazon Prime membership, you can subscribe for free uh, through Twitch. And that's it for tonight, guys. I'll see you on Tuesday. Bye.